Hi, I'm Reverend Paul Ashby, and I invite you to join us as we seek to follow the compassionate heart of Jesus in our world today. My name is Stacy Schulmerich, and I'm the Director of Faith Formation to Children, Youth, and Families. Hi, I'm Susan. Hi, I'm Anthony. I'm Katie Scovold, and Susan and Anthony and I are your music team. I'm Dan Thompson, Chair of Worship Life, and we're so glad you're here with us during the season of Lent. Although our church building is closed right now, the heart of our church is very much open. Please visit our website to find more about RBCC and join us for a post-worship coffee hour on Zoom. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. In the Bible study last week, I had a person who asked about original sin. There is 
No original sin in the Bible. The words never appear in the New Testament or the Old Testament. Why? Because it was a theological notion invented in the fourth century by St. Augustine. Talk with any Jewish rabbi in any tradition, and they have no concept whatsoever of original sin. Their tradition created the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden story, the story of Adam and Eve. And in their story, they find no concept whatsoever of original sin. So I invite you to throw away any idea or story about original sin from your past or some religious conditioning. Just press delete. See if that doesn't free you to hear the story of creation as an original blessing. It's Matthew Fox's concept that all of creation, all of life, and your life is the original blessing of God. After this creation event, God said, reflected upon all of creation, not only that it was good, but it was very good. We live in that original blessing. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Today is the fifth Sunday of Lent. And before I go into the opening prayer, I want to give you just an idea of what's going to be happening next Sunday at this time. So next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And we celebrate that in kind of a, a two-part act. Act one will be here at 1015. And at that 1015 time, you will see an abbreviated, shorter, quick service featuring our very own seven chord pileup, because what would Palm Sunday be without seven chord pileup to us? And then there'll be an intermission around mm, 1045. Then during that intermission, you get in your cars, you grab your keys and you drive to church. And at 1130, there will be a celebratory Palm Sunday parade. And that parade will feature a drumming circle and fresh palms to wave and shout Hosanna. There will be scripture read aloud. You will have the opportunity to drop off your food bank donations that you've been collecting all of Lent. There will be, get this, RBCC Youth Group is making you Easter pancake mix to go along with jam and syrup, a little spoon, it's awesome. So please come to worship next Sunday at 1015 and 1130, okay? And so to open today's service, which Pastor Paul has said focuses on environmental health, I offer this opening prayer. Many named one, beyond imagining, we contemplate the night sky, the cosmos which all unfolded from a speck, galaxies and stars and this beautiful earth. Who are we humans that you attend to us? We are mortals in our tiny corners and you love us? We are life come to knowing and feeling. The world is in our hands. Plants and animals, oceans and ice caps and rainforests, atmospheres and ecosystems. Touch our hearts today, God. Make us worthy of this trust that you have given us a hand in your care and restoration of all things. Majestic are all of your ways, God, and in all ways we will worship you. Amen.
For intergenerational time today, I once again want to bring you a holy vessel as we have been doing throughout Lent. And since today, Pastor Paul said that we are talking about environmental health and nature, I thought I would bring in a piece of the environment and nature for you. And today's holy vessel is a nest. Nests are places of transformation. Within a nest happens love and care and commitment and patience and waiting. Yep, nests are where love grows, where transformation happens. Nests are also very fragile. They, they take and require great care and repair and watchfulness. Never touch a nest in the wild though. This one is from a craft store. Never touch a nest in the wild because you don't know what birds are there. So nests are also meant to be abandoned. I'll share my nest story with you. Every spring, we always seem to buy a, a hanging fuchsia for our porch. It reminds us of our Papa Dan. And one year, birds built a nest right down in the middle of that hanging fuchsia. And they cared for their three eggs day and night. They repaired their nest. And then the day came when the eggs hatched. And if you stood on your tiptoes, you could look in and you could see those three baby birds with their downturned beaks. And then came the day when the old world wore away. It was time to be outgrown. And those three baby eggs and those three little birds that came from them, it was time for them to go. And those three birds happened to fly out of the nest on the day of my daughter's high school graduation, and there was meaning in that. Nests become thresholds, a, a jumping off point from what a bird leaves behind to what a bird is taking flight into. Nests symbolize holding places where we have gone through great restoration and transformation. Think of that. We've been on hold. This whole year has been like a nest, a holding place, on hold from work and school and traveling and family and friends, from fully living in the ways that we knew. But now conditions are changing just a little bit and we are reaching a threshold. So we know that no matter how scared and cautious we are, the time is coming where we're going to have to cross the threshold from where we've been to where we're going. So we are excited and anxious. We've reached the edge of the nest. How have we been transformed? How have you been changed by this year on hold or in hold? What are we ready to abandon and leave behind? And what are we gonna in our rush to leave the nest back into normal life, what is worth flying back into? Be ready, friends. Transformation happens. The threshold will come and we will be able to leave behind a little bit of what we've grown through and fly into what's next. So care for your nest because it is a holy vessel. Amen. In terms of joys and concerns for this week, 
In a joy, I want to add a word of praise for local tribal groups in the state of Washington that shared their extra vaccine with teachers in our state. What a wonderful gesture of community and support and care. Peace, shalom, salam. A second joy came from Welma. Welma shared a joy that the Seahawks kept quarterback Russell Wilson. Yes, quarterbacks often get the blame for a win or a loss, but the major problem with the Seahawks, I hate to say it, is both the offensive line and the defensive lines are dysfunctional. So yes, let's not blame the quarterback. And yes, we do appreciate Russell Wilson. Peace, shalom, salam. In terms of concerns for our community, for the national community, and for our world, after the eight murders in Atlanta, we pray for an end to the blame game and the scapegoating of others, particularly Asian Americans. In the last two months, over 500 hate crimes against Asian Americans have been reported in our nation. Anti-Asian hate crimes have increased 150% in 2020, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. Most of the reported incidents happened after former President Trump started calling COVID the China flu and the Kung flu. That is the power of misuse and targeting of others. We also pray for the local Japanese Rinzai Buddhist temple in Fremont, a Fremont where before COVID, I often led the Monday night meditation group. Last week, they were broken into through the kitchen window and vandalized. Once again, another targeting of a group of Asians who are our neighbors, our friends. Peace, shalom, salam. We also pray for Kareen's family with the death of her brother Roy after his long and dedicated battle against cancer. The family did a wonderful, amazing job of compassionate personal care in his last years of struggle. We're grateful for the goodness he experienced. And we're grateful that his favorite hobby, golfing, he was able to do up until just a few weeks ago. So we're grateful for Roy and his life and the good memories he leaves with his family. Peace, shalom, salam. Let us enter into prayer together. Holy Presence, grant us the gift of awareness that we would truly feel, see, and experience the blessings of this earth. We're thankful for the love that is revealed through creation and ongoing evolution. We praise you for the magnificent expanse of this expanding universe. We offer our hearts gratitude for the beauty of this little blue island planet of delightful diversity. We celebrate the gift of life after surviving the first year of the COVID global pandemic. We share our joy in the gifts of nature that sustain us through this year of isolation as many of us would look forward each day just to simply walk outdoors, to breathe the air, to see the mountains. Help us to protect and preserve this little blue island planet of delightful diversity. Awaken us to the truth of our interdependence on all living beings and on our interdependence on the air, water, and soil of this earth. We thank you for this gift that we have received. We thank you for the original blessing of creation. And we pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Holy God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever. Amen. Good morning, church. I am Erica Street, the chair of the Outreach Board this year. I love RBCC UCC. The heart of this church is compassionate, kind, welcoming, generous, and justice-seeking. You are all beautiful people, and together we are the heartbeat of this church. After a sorting process, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 34 through 40, and I'm reading from the message, the king will say, enter, you who are blessed by my father. The kingdom has been ready for you since the world's foundation, and here is why. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the sheep, previously sorted, are going to ask, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will say, I am telling you the truth. Whenever you did it for someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. Church, we do these things that Jesus spoke of for each other and for our community together. This year, we have fed hungry neighbors by collecting over a thousand pounds of donated food and related items in just one food drive in January. We have another opportunity to give food at the Palm Sunday service. A portion of our financial gifts goes to feeding our neighbors on a regular basis too. Jesus thanks you. We have people in our church who are dedicated to calling and visiting when possible and sending cards of comfort to those who are sick. Jesus thanks you. People in our church are also dedicated to justice and visit those in prison and are advocating for criminal justice reform and freeing those unjustly detained. Jesus thanks you. A portion of your giving goes out wide to support mission aligned organizations and a portion of your giving stays right here in our neighborhood and goes out to people experiencing homelessness and families with young children on a regular basis. Jesus thanks you. When a crisis happens in our community, we are called to help and together we do. Jesus says thank you. We know there is a ripple effect in the lives of our neighbors because all of us together. Thank you for giving. If you would like to give a donation, here are the ways you can. Give online anytime from your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Please go to our website, rbccucc.org, and click on the donation tab. You can also send a donation via text at 206-785-2549. And you can always mail a check to the church office at 1512 Northwest 195th Street, Shoreline, Washington, 98177. Thank you, church. Praise God for Like a bird who has fallen, I rest in your hands, hoping and praying you will understand and fill in the 
pieces never fully there healing my soul Lord with your love and care can make all the difference which each each can you lift me to freedom in the boundless sky? Can I run in safety? Will you fill my heart? Can you ready me for a brand new start? God, I wait here before you. As we look at the theme of the original blessing of creation itself and ongoing evolution, I'm reminded of one of my favorite psalms, the eighth psalm, which talks about God's presence and the gift of life in nature. It reads as follows. O oh God, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, and out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded this world. You have silenced the enemy and the avenger. When we look at the heavens, at the work of your hands, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you're mindful of us? Human mortals that you care about us. Yet you have made us just a little lower than angels and crowned us with glory and honor. You've given us dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under your feet, all sheep and oxen and birds of the field, 
all the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the pathways of the sea. O oh God, O oh Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. If you look at global art, you'll see that people of faith have created works of art where God is presented as white or black or yellow or red or brown, depending on the culture. But if I had to pick a color for God, it would be none of the above. For me, God is green. God in the Genesis story is the creation, energy, that gives us life. God is the source of life that sustains every atom. God is the one who brings forth the beauty and the bounty of this earth. When I look at the wonder of new life, the rebirth of spring, of the resurrection of nature, everything, Everything screams of a God who is green. My love of spring connects me to my love of God. So if I had to pick a color, knowing that God has no color, I would say God is green. And as children of this green God, we celebrate this wonderful, beautiful, fragile planet that we inhabit. The vision that we need to have as children of this green God is to preserve an environment to protect this earth from pollution and the abuse created by short-sighted greed and ignorance. Spiritual people of every faith tradition honor this earth as a holy gift. This earth is our original blessing. In the Christian tradition, we are each stewards of creation and ongoing evolution. One scientist in a Bill Moyers interview proclaimed, because I care about the creator, I care about creation. How about if we reverse that? How about if we could say boldly, because I care about creation. It shows that I care about the creator. The next time you hear someone attacked as a tree hugger, do what I have done with people who dismiss the environmental equation as relevant. I'll invite that person who slanders the tree hugger to go with me to the top floor of a building and simply look out the windows and ask, what would this landscape be without trees? March and April are bold, beautiful green months of spring here. And I don't know about you, but I would kind of like it to remain that way in terms of global climate change and environmental protection, it's not to talk about environmental issues, it's not to talk about liberal issues or Christian issues or radical environmental issues. What could be more conservative than conserving this planet as a place of life? Human beings are consuming fossil fuels, of fuels as if there's no tomorrow. And if we continue to produce carbon dioxide at the rate in which it has increased since the Industrial Revolution, there will be no tomorrow. The world's major religions have said it's our responsibility to protect the earth and the life that depends on it. St. Francis wrote an entire book on this issue an encyclical. On the other side of the divide, for many Christian fundamentalists, they're waiting for the end of the world. So events like climate change are welcome because they're looking for the day we'll be whisked off and sucked up into the clouds for the rapture. 
please don't tell them, or maybe do tell them, that the rapture theory was invented 109 years ago by this strange, odd person named John Nelson, Nelson Darby in England, a member of the Plymouth Brethren group. More earthbound traditions, more earthbound Christians are beginning to ponder the biblical story about what it means to care for this earth, to exercise dominion as we are called to do in the book of Genesis. It's said we're to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl, over the air, over every living thing that moves upon this earth. Does dominion mean that we are entitled to blow the tops off entire mountain ranges to get the coal beneath? According to one fundamentalist Christian industrialist in West Virginia, that's exactly what we are called to do. I see a different world and a different creator where we are called to preserve the beauty and majesty of this earth. We live in a consumer-oriented, materialistic, sometimes small-minded culture that teaches us all we need is more, and all we need is more things. But once you blow the top off of West Virginia mountains, you just can't rebuild that. It's lost. Every ad we see is often an ad that spurs us to do things that in the long run can be detrimental to our own environment. We're beginning to see a climate change that threatens the future. Every major rainstorm in South Florida now floods the streets of Miami. People finally are asking, what will the earth be like for my children, for my grandchildren, for my nieces and nephews, and yes, for their children? Will they have clean air? Will they, will they have clean water? Will they have places of beauty to appreciate? Will they have a healthy, sustainable life? Or will their future be cursed with toxic pollution, dramatically increased cancer rates, and a constant struggle against a poisoned environment? Will they look back to our time in 2021 with thoughts of gratitude for us or words of condemnation? Will they study all the emails in the business world and yes, even in church to see if we cared about the big issues or if we only cared about small, petty, nonsense issues? What will they see when they look at the record of our emails and business decisions and corporate decisions? and mission decisions about the future of this earth? Will they see people who saw the big picture or the narrowness of blind bureaucrats who missed the entire point? The question of faith is one that calls us to stand and warn society of the choices that could impact future generations of this human race. My friends, we live on a beautiful, tiny little island planet. If you look at our solar system, we live in the Garden of Eden. We live on a life-giving island with oxygen, water, living soil, sunlight, and wonderful friends. This earth is a blessing. And now that you see the pictures from Mars, are you ready and excited to move there? I would think through that reflection. To me, the greatest issue of the 21st century is the ultimate issue of life. What shall we do with this tiny island we live on? Mother Jones magazine had an article where various experts reflected on the future on the issue of extinction. And when we talk about extinction, we're not just talking about the rhino or a tiger or blue whale. These are sad sagas that are part of the extinction issue. But the overall effects are much more complicated and scary. 
The World Conservation Union has assessed that one in four mammals, one in eight birds, one in three amphibians are in danger of extinction. And the peril faced by other classes of organisms are also analyzed and are frightening. That when we look at those being threatened, it's more than half of all reptiles, more than half of all insects, and 73% of flowering plants. In a staggering forecast, Edward O. Wilson predicted at our present course, we would lead to the extinction of half of all plants and animal life by the year 2100. By the end of our century, half of all plant and animal species would no longer be with us. That prediction should wake us up, should teach us about what is important and what is less important, what is minutia, what is of no consequence. Think about it. Half, lost, extinct, no longer a part of creation and evolution. That should awaken us. We're all living in a time of great crisis. The choices we make as a nation and as a people will have dramatic impact on the world of our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews and their children. We are called to focus our love on this little island planet called Earth. In the Genesis story, we are created from the elements of the Earth. The Earth is part and parcel of who we are. It's in the fabric of our very being. It is from this little island planet that we draw all the things we need to survive. This little planet is home not only for simply humans, but for plants and animals who share in our life, who share in the life-giving soil and sun and water. Environmental care is so much more than politics. It's a spiritual breakthrough to deeply understand our connection to this island. The toxic wastes we dump are toxins that we dump upon ourselves and future generations. The life forms we push to extinction are creations of God. The nuclear waste we bury because it's so dangerous is dangerous for the next 20,000 years. The destruction we apply to the environment comes back to impact us in terms of human cancer rates, leukemia, drought conditions, and climate change. In this era of global pandemic, we have leaders, or so-called leaders, where their great issue of this month was Mr. Potato Head. And a publisher who's no longer publishing some of Dr. Seuss's books, I say to them, get a life, look around, see what is happening in our world. And no one, no one has banned a single book. Get a life. I would also want to hold up one of Dr. Seuss's books that you should buy for your children because it's a beautiful reflection on the environmental issue. I love the Dr. Seuss book, The Lorax. The Lorax, Lorax was this creature who spoke for all the trees until there were no more trees to speak for. And then the Lorax spoke for the fish until they were gone, lost, suffocated by toxic sludge. And then the Lorax spoke for the birds until they could no longer breathe the air and had to leave. And then he spoke for these teddy bear-like forest creatures who were forced out due to starvation. Finally, there was no life left to speak for, so the Lorax departed. But he left one message for the future. With a pile of rocks, he created a monument. With just one word for the future, the word Unless. Unless what? Unless who? Uh, unless, huh? 
The book explains. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. Unless there's a word of invitation. Unless there's a word of challenge. Unless there's a word of courage. Unless we care to love this little island we live upon. It will no longer be able to sustain life as we know it. Unless we open our hearts to truly big issues of caring for our earth, future generations will curse our small-minded institutions and our small-minded churches. There's a wisdom, a wisdom in that word, unless. Amen. The closing prayer today is a simple blessing that is an excerpt from a John O'Donohue poem. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of the light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protections of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Amen.
shall go out with joy and be that forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the fields will clap Be led forth in peace. The mountains and the dales will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy. The trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands as you go out with.